I am super, super, super excited to have a very, very special guest with us today, Sylvia Earle. And let me get this record straight here. Sylvia was Time Magazine's first hero of the planet. She was called a living legend by the Library of Congress, is the founder of Mission Blue, and we'll surely talk about this a little bit, and has been or is a National Geographic explorer in residence, of which we actually have one in our faculty as well. Um, Sylvia, I'm super, super excited that you're here. You truly dedicated your life to the oceans. Um, how comes? Why, why did you make that commitment? Without the ocean, none of us would be here. Mm. <laughs> and I just found the ocean to be, what, irresistible as a child, and I still find it so. There's just endless diversity of life, or maybe not endless, but we're still exploring the ocean. We've only literally scratched the surface, so there's so much to discover there. Any little kid can look at the ocean and find things that no one has seen before. It's really remarkable that we live at a time of the, the greatest era of exploration is just beginning. What is your, what is your sense of how, how far are we like down the path of it becoming irre irreversible, right? This is in climate change, this is like the notion of the runaway climate, right? Where oh. the tipping point can come where we probably don't have control over it anymore, right? When you think about the ocean, where are we on this, on this, on this scale? Uh, whether it's trees or birds, or now we're, we've turned our attention to wildlife in the sea with technologies that make not just the finding, the extraction, but also the marketing on a global scale of life from the ocean. But at the same time, we're also technologically superior as compared to any time in the past in understanding why it matters. So we don't have tuna fish anymore, so what? No whales. If you've never seen a whale, why would you care? What's a whale ever done for me, right? Yeah. But when you look at the whole picture and you can see the chemistry of the ocean tied to the chemistry of life, the, the eat and be eaten, the, chemi the chemical pathways of nutrients, and understand that when you take a breath, <laughs> in a way you should thank a whale because they consume phytoplankton but they give nutrients back that makes the phytoplankton prosper, which generates the oxygen that we breathe. I actually want to talk about the solutions because that's where the whole part comes right. because I'm feeling pretty down at the no, moment, trust me. The good um, news is we know. Right. We got the you knowledge. have actually created or named something called Hope Spots, yes. which that sounds just beautiful. Tell me a bit more about it. What are they? What is the concept? Well, a century ago, the United States actually, on a, something that had already begun, people protecting the land, because you could see if you don't embrace it, a place with proactively, with care, it is likely to be homogenized and turned into something other than the distillation of all that has preceded us. These wild places, wild rivers, wild forests, old growth forests, that are the result of a lot of interaction among for a long period of time with solutions to questions we raise, like who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? How does the planet work anyway? And national parks, the national park system. Mm, what a great idea. Yeah. Partly inspired because of beautiful landscape, landscapes, places where for recreation, but now they've become even more important as centers of biodiversity. I think it's because people recognize our dependence on nature, and it isn't just because they're beautiful, aesthetically or even morally the right thing to do to save old trees and to not let the last panda be killed yeah. or the last anything, but that we are connected. In the ocean, it's the same thing, blue parks, mm. blue parks, inspired by the success of parks on the land to do the same thing in the ocean, but, but underpinned with a new understanding that we need the natural systems that keep us alive. And the, 
at this point to identify those most critical areas to first, one would like to think, here's all of nature, do no harm, mm -hmm. work within the systems. Right. And so working with the International Union for the Conservation of yeah. Nature, IUCN, Mission Blue has developed a framework, also working with Esri, a California-based yeah. company that uh, we're also working with Google to, to be able to show these hope spots on Google Earth. And so it. it's yeah. a way to empower people at the local level. In fact, it's critical that that happen, as well as at the governmental level, and not just for your backyard or out to the edge of our exclusive economic zones around the world. But then there's the high seas beyond. That's half the world is beyond national jurisdiction where we have to work together yeah. to protect the global commons because that's where the heavy lifting takes place in generating oxygen, taking up carbon, holding the planet steady, governing climate and weather. And so it's Hope Spots, I think, the concept gives a name to a concept, and I hope, inspires hope, that we're not without power. We have the capacity armed with knowledge to look in the mirror, understand each of us who and what we are and what our power is to do something to make better choices about what we eat, about what we wear, about what we buy, you know, all those things in the context of protecting the natural world and being mindful of our impact. And every person counts. And if we pull together, anything's possible. <laughs>